You're tuned to 1520 WCAT Radio, and it's time now for the Avid Reader Show with your host, Sam Hankin. Sam will offer reviews and interviews of some of the more interesting books and authors of today, and now Sam Hankin. Afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Avid Reader. Today, we're happy to have as our guest Kevin Powers, author of The Yellow Birds, uh, which was a finalist for the National Book Award and listed by the New York Times as one of the 10 best books of 2012. And if you look at the beginning of the book, I mean, there's scores of people who have praised this book and Kevin's won uh, uh, numerous awards and this is his first novel Uh, you know and it seems like Kevin's first love we'll ask him is poetry Um, uh, this is a a tale of and all I can call it is the war on terror because that's the only name that the war has Um, it's a poetic novel rightfully so Um, and um, Kevin served in the war from 2004 to 2005 and did see combat as a machine gunner. So welcome, Kevin, and and thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Well, I'm always curious about epigraphs, and yours are tough ones. (laughs) Um, The first one, which is uh, from which derives the name of the novel from, um, reads, as much as I can read of it, a yellow bird with a yellow bill was perched upon my windowsill. I lured him in with a piece of bread, and then I smashed his blanking head. Right. So, and and that's a marine cadence for marching, is that right? Uh, Army, yeah. Army. Right. Well, so, what gave rise to you naming the book that after that epigraph? Because it kind of rounds the book out almost. Right. Well, I you know I I remember after I was out of the military. Um, Encountering that cadence, I, I don't remember the context exactly, but but um, you know, for the first time, I um, kind of recognized it was it was shocked by the actual content. Um, you know what what's actually being described in the cadence, and and you know, it was something that I I'd, I'd, I'd sung very loudly, you know, among a group of other you know eighteen year olds. Um, hundreds of times probably um, never really recognizing uh, exactly what was being described so I was interested in in that relationship to violence the kind of callous relationship to violence that's represented in the cadence and the way that uh, that you so easily slip into that kind of relationship to violence um, so you know I, I there's also, you know, the kind of uh, the idea of uh, of the bird, which which appears as an image, um, as an image uh, throughout throughout the book. And I, I've also always kind of been been fascinated by. Um, I wouldn't say quite phobic, but but I have a bit of a bird thing. They kind of freak me out a little bit. Um, there's something about the sort of the fragility of, of them as creatures, but also this obvious incredible capacity that they have for for flight. So, you know, when I was looking for a way, okay, how am I going to introduce the reader to the, the kind of thing that I'm interested in, in talking about and exploring in this book um, in terms of being just very upfront about the kind of relationship to violence that uh, was going to be described in the book. Well, um, such... I thought that cadence sort of fulfilled that that part of it, and then and then the other epigraph, um, I think, kind of indicates a different aspect of, of the story and and what I'm interested in looking at. Well, the first is so callous and uncivilized, and um, you know, uncaring towards death, almost you know, wanting to do that to the bird. And the second seems at first like it's not nearly as nasty, but. Um, it's, you know, um, from Sir Thomas Brown says, to be ignorant of evils to come and forgetful of evils past is a merciful provision in nature, whereby we digest the mixture of our few and evil days and our delivered senses not replacing into cutting remembrances. Our sorrows are not kept raw by the edge of repetitions. And that's like, you know, okay, thank God we can forget what we did because if we didn't, there'd be this constant razor cutting into our flesh absolutely yeah and i mean those are sort of the two um the two approaches i'm taking to to the subject matter one wanting to be 
wanting to be honest and direct and acknowledge the kind of uh, the rawness and, and uh, of of the experience of, of participating in violence and witnessing violence, and then on the other hand, um, also wanting the the novel to be uh, to provide an opportunity to reflect on the consequences of that kind of behavior, uh, the consequences that it has uh, in people's lives. So, so I thought you know those two epigraphs would 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 sort of be complementary and trying to sort of give people an idea of what uh, what what the novel was trying to do. Well, it's interesting because both of those quotes made me think of George Sat- Satayana. And, you know, the famous quote, those who do not remember the past are doomed to repeat it, which is kind of like your second one. Right. And the other thing he said is, you know, only the dead have seen the end of war. And um, that is kind of partially your theme in the book. And if you go back to your poem, a uh, letter composed during a lull in the fighting, what Bartle says, as quoted by maybe someone like Murph, who wrote a letter home, um, is that war is just making little pieces of metal pass through each other which is exactly what it is, and, and frames Bartle's kind of um, internal monologue regarding the war that keeps him semi-sane. Right, right, yeah. I mean, you know, uh, uh, one of the things that I wanted to look at was the different, you know, strategies um, or coping mechanism. How, I mean, you know, however you want to kind of uh, talk about it. Um, getting by, um, you know, and Bartle, Bartle I think, has different ways that he he sort of tries to uh, to deal with the circumstances that he finds himself in and finds himself in, and he also sees other examples of, of of the kind of compromises that people are willing to make to to stay alive, to preserve different parts of their humanity. Uh, you know, so it's certainly something that I was conscious of. You know, one of, I, I read somewhere in one of your interviews about the name Bartle, and you said, uh, you talked a little bit about how you got that name in your head. Why don't you tell our listeners, if if, if you know, where that name came from? Because I have a theory about it. <laughs> yeah, no, so, you know, when you're, at least for me, when I'm trying to figure out um, names of, of characters, you know, I generally want it to be a name that a person would actually have. Um, so on the and on you know in that respect, uh, Bartle is a is a is an actual surname. Um, but I, I also felt like there was this kind of connection to um, you know to Melville, to yeah. the Scrivener, yep. and um, and again talking about strategies, ways of uh, of uh, of being in the world, um, you know, attempting to kind of. Um, React and withdraw from uh, you know the difficulties that the world presents us with, and um, you know that was a that was just an important uh, story for me. I remember you know the first time I read it when I was in high school, and um, you know I just thought, well, you know, there's some kind of maybe not overlap, but but a bit of a parallel there in terms of how Bartle um, tries to deal with his environment and. Uh, so it was kind of just uh, just in terms of trying to find the name. It was sort of an inspiration, and and it was resonant for me. So, yes, yeah, so the first thing I thought was Barbie the Scrivener, and it's like one of my favorite books. And so many people don't like Melville because of Moby Dick, and they don't like that story either. But you know, the idea of saying I'd rather not right. is what Bartle's trying to get to. Yeah, exactly. Uh, unsuccessfully, exactly. though. Par- Partially, maybe partially successfully, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, and also the movie with what's his name? I've forgotten the guy's name. Have you seen the movie, The Barbie the Scrivener? No, I don't think I have. It's great because it brings it to modern times. Um, so I think you would identify with your book more by okay. seeing the movie. And it's that really quirky guy that plays Bartleby, and he'll like spend the day in the office looking up at the air conditioning vent just sta- looking up at it all day long right and his boss doesn't want to hurt his feelings doesn't want to fire him but doesn't know what to do with him <laughs> right <laughs> right and then that goes again since so Bartle goes like to the opening line of your novel which is kind of not yet achieved but almost achieved the same status as Thomas Pynchon's opening line um, which is a screaming comes across the sky it has happened before but there is nothing to compare it now 
compare it to now, mm. whereas yours is the war tried to kill us in the spring. And uh, both of those, again, like take you out of the war and let you... Well, you, you explain it, that first line. How did you come up with that, and what does it mean? Right, well, no, I mean, I think for... You know, the narrator of, of the novel for, for Bartle, there's um, the sensation, uh, and I think ultimately it's a, it's, a, it's a kind of misinterpretation of the facts, but there's this idea that the war is something larger than um, the people who are participating in it, uh, that it's something um, outside of, of their control, uh, and it's as an individual, I think he finds himself inside of this thing, and he feels utterly powerless um, to to really do anything to to control his his own destiny, to to do anything about about it, other than sort of just do uh, his very best to kind of survive. Um, and I think you know one of the things that he by the end of by the end of the book that he'll you perhaps see that in a different light is, is this kind of recognition that, um, uh, you know, that sort of the only, as as human beings, as, as people, as citizens, um, you know, the only monster that uh, is able to kill us is the, the one that we create ourselves. So so it's actually, you know, it, it, it feels like this thing that's greater than the sum of its parts, but... Um, and in a lot of ways, I mean, there are so many variables and so many factors. Um, it's understandable why he feels like it's got this life of its own, like it's its own thing, like it's feeding. And, um, so, you know, I wanted to start that way um, just to try to give a sort of uh, an immediate and, and, and direct access and, and to, you know, first above, above everything else, Bartle's feeling of this kind of incredible powerlessness and that there's this being inside of this uh this creature that's gone absolutely out of control yeah and it's funny because it's like the creature is the war you know it's not people killing each other it's the war that tries to kill you right and that's you know that's after all the i think the the illusion that he's um he's contending with you know and it's it's powerful because i think i think that's a um, that's a feeling that people often have, that there's this this other thing happening. You know, it's funny. In the past month, <laughs> I've interviewed uh, David Abrams, who wrote Fobbit. Yeah, sure. I've interviewed Phil Clay, who wrote Redeployment. Right. And now you. So two questions. One, w- why do we write about war anyway? Why are, the, why are you guys all writing about a war... Um, that, in in my opinion, wasn't a war because I never knew who the enemy actually was. Right. Um, well, what do you what do you think it is that drives, you know, uh, drives authors to? I mean, I know there's so many times people say you're never as alive as the moment that you're in a war with your buddies, watching your buddy get killed, killing other people. That you'll you'll never have that feeling of life. Again, right. which is so strange, but how does that give rise to this? What are you trying to tell us, and why are you trying to tell us this? Yeah, no, and and um, and I really admire both of both me, of those me too. those guys and both of those books. Um, you know, I think what it is is um, <clears throat> in 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 my case, um, and in the case of of the story that I wrote, and, and really in the case of, of John Bartle too, it's, it's 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 trying to find a way where you can um, make sense of your own story, right? You can kind of make sense of what happened to you, or or attempt to anyway. Um, and I think, particularly for 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 Bartle, for my narrator, he's, he's he has this incredible sense of of guilt. And and shame and regret and so forth and I think he's trying to kind of like like trace the pieces one by one and figure out what exactly he's responsible for you know 
what is he, you know, who is he in debt to? Um, you know, this kind of, he's like, kind of got this, like, psychological or spiritual, like, deficit that he's running. And yeah. I think he's trying to figure out, like, how he can pay it back. And to do that, he has to understand, um, he has to understand, you know, what, what he did, what happened. Um, and I think that kind of thing is probably true for, for most veterans who, who write. It's like, I want to figure this thing out. I mean, it's a, you know, maybe it's an impossible task to, to, to have it figured out, but I think the effort to understand, to figure out, okay, you know, you, you realize that, um, that these experiences are going to contribute to, to the person that you are for the rest of your life. But um, it also becomes important to ask the question, um, you know, am I going to be defined by, by these experiences? Am I going to be limited by the experiences? Can I be, um, can I be both, um, you know, somebody who's had, somebody who's gone to war and somebody who, you know, is is many other things, a music lover, a, a fisherman, I mean, you know, whatever, X, Y, Z. Um, so I think it's just really a process of, of exploring your your place in a world that, um, that, uh, that in a lot of ways you sort of are trying to re-recognize, you're trying to, to redefine um, where and who you are and, and and I think probably, um, you know, in my case, and, and I would imagine in, in David and Phil's cases, probably they've always been people who used writing to, to ask those kinds of questions. And, and uh, you know, certainly certainly true for me. Yeah, but, it, you know, if you're a fisherman or if you work in uh, uh, a tower and you have a boss and you sit at a desk and you write reports or you go out... <coughs> and fly to Hong Kong and try to sell titanium or widgets or whatever, mm -hmm. you don't have that same accessibility. And what's funny, as I was looking at combat deaths, so in World War II, uh, there were um, uh, 291,000 American deaths. In the Civil War, there were 212,000. World War I was 53,000. Vietnam was 47,000. Korea was 33,000. The Revolutionary War was 8,000. Right. And the War on Terror was 5,281. And you have these books, you know, A Farewell to Arms, From Here to Eternity, Catch-22, The Naked and the Dead, Slaughterhouse-Five, A Red Badge of Courage. And it seems to me is it doesn't really make any difference the number of casualties. What it is is that you have access to something in war that you don't have in any other aspect of human life. Oh, well, I mean, yeah, there's, there's the, I think there's, there is the very basic principle of, of trying to communicate something to another person who doesn't necessarily understand it, right? So, yeah. uh, and a lot of that is, is trying to find a way out of, um, uh, you know, I think one of the consequences of, uh, of war, I know is pretty, um, pretty common and beginning to be sort of widely recognized and acknowledged is that, that it, that it can cause, a uh, kind of sensation of being isolated and those who have experienced it. So in a lot of ways, you know, writing is communication and you're and you're and you're talking and you're sharing these stories and you're um, um, you know, you're not constantly leaving it you know, as a as a kind of internal operation in your own mind. Um, yeah. and there is a I think there's a in many cases a curiosity and a desire on the part of people who haven't had this experience to to have some kind of window into what it might be like and uh well that's the other part of it it's like right. that it's like that uh you know how many marines does it take you know to screw in a light bulb and you know the answer is you wouldn't know you weren't there <laughs> right <laughs> And, yeah, yeah, there is this kind of band of brothers thing going on. But it's really interesting because, you know, you have a lot of characters in the book, but basically um, it's kind of like a Greek tragedy. You have Bartle, you have Murph, and you have Sterling. Right. 
and uh, there's just the three of them. And, and it's really funny because, you know, one could be considered pure evil, one could be considered pure innocence, and then Bartle can be this ambivalent admixture of both. But you make the reader really work hard. And then the fourth thing, of course, is Bartle's kind of inner monologue. <coughs> right. And it's structured much like a poem, almost like, you know, like a Paradise Lost kind of thing. But then you make the reader work really hard because the same as Bartle, you know, you kind of like you're drawn to Sterling and Bartle loves him and hates him. And I think the reader does, too. And then with Murphy, yeah, you love him because he's an innocent, but he's also an idiot. Right. And and then Bartle, what is Bartle? Is he the worst of them? Is he the best of them? You know, you make the wor the reader work really hard, which I think is the mark of a really good novel. Well, I appreciate that very much. Yeah, and I mean, one of the things that I was that I was, uh, I, I'm not uh, certainly not uh, disputing your your assessment of the characters. That that very very well describes kind of how I think about them as well. But but also that at various points in in their story, um, that they behave you know different from the way that you you expect them to. There are moments when Sterling shows kind of uh, compassion. Um, there are moments when uh, when when Murphy is uh, so sort of more effective as a soldier than um, uh, than Bartle. And yeah, I, I, you know, I wanted to kind of show the sort of you know, the fluidity of, of that kind of behavior, but that uh, you know, Bartle sort of again, as we talked about earlier, he's seeing these strategies of, of how do I how do I get out of this that kind of thing. You know, it's funny again for the reader the scene uh, where Sterling is in the brothel and treats that woman the way he treats her. Mm -hmm. um, it's like then where you really think, I hate this guy so much. But then part of you is thinking, wait a minute, I kind of understand, kind of, kind of, why he's doing it. And it makes it very difficult for you in your own mind you know, to recognize those things in yourself because everyone has that particular breaking point. It's just right, a question right, sure. of where it is on the bell curve. Right, absolutely, yeah, and I mean, you know, it's, uh, you know, I think that's kind of the challenge that is presented to to us as writers and, and also as readers is to to be able to recognize um, ourselves in um, in each of the characters, not necessarily, you know, not not to, to agree or support the, right. things, the things that he does, but to say, like, okay, I mean, I, I, I this guy's essentially... Uh, destroyed his his capacity for kind of moral <laughs> behavior, or you know, um, just not not equipped to kind of handle uh, a very basic interaction like that um, anymore. And uh, you know, trying to, to yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, it, the appropriate response is that like that's horrible, but maybe I can see why this guy is being so horrible. Um, well, it's kind of bookended, too, because you know that's the moment where you really hate him the most. And he's not really a person in a lot of ways. That's true, yeah. And, and then, then at the end, what happens to him, it's almost as if it's, I don't know, not Christ-like, but, uh, you know, it, 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 it does bookend it because at the very end, you know, you hear from Bartle, um, yeah, you know what's happened and it's kind of like you know I've done all these things there's only one option left right yeah no and I think I think at some point in the book you know you probably recognize um, how you know how it's going to end for Sterling I don't know you know what I didn't I didn't think he was I didn't think he would ever be able to reflect that totally on his past actions. Oh, okay. Well, I, yeah. I mean, I guess I, so. I guess my thinking was that if he ever got to a point where he was able to to look look at his behavior and actions, um, then 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 you would see that. That's what I was kind of show trying right. to show is that he, when he when he's in a position where um, he he's not able to focus solely on the immediate task at hand. That uh, that he could potentially be in big trouble. It's like a fall from grace, and then you know I've always thought in the Christian small C way, you know, like 
if at the very end, after a life uh, like a, who was the poet Valan? Vil- Vil- mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's like if at the very last you confess and you reform, even in your last breath, then in Christianity, then you'll meet Jesus in heaven in an hour. Right. And it's almost like that's what he did. <coughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I think um, in a way he's uh, he's looking for that same thing, you know, the same thing that that Bartle's looking for, some kind of way of, of uh, expe- uh, accepting a degree of a degree of responsibility, well, accountability. Yeah, but what they can't find is absolution. That's right. Yeah. That's right. That's why everything, and that's any war. I mean, that's the thing is it could be two casualties or two million casualties. And what happens in it, you know, I've said this before. I said it to both authors. We have a very thin veneer of civilization. Right. And I use the metaphor of like when you get cream brulee for dessert, you know, it has this crust on top and you can tap it and it's hard. But if you tap it a little harder, you get all this mushy stuff underneath. (laughs) Yeah, no, that's true. Yeah. Well, go ahead. Yeah. And what I was going to say was um, I've, I tried to get Abrams to say it was a horrible war, shouldn't have happened. He wouldn't do it, even though his book kind of said that. Mm-hmm. I tried to get Phil Clay to say that, and he wouldn't say it. Um, and I don't know why. So if I asked you, was it a meaningless exercise that served no purpose? And when you say support our troops, the only way you can really support them is by bringing them back. Would you agree with that? Uh, specifically with regard to to Iraq, I would. Yeah, I mean, I think Afghanistan um, requires the you know uh, uh, requires a bit more discussion. I think um, I, I I see when people talk about justification for going there, I'm I'm uh, able to be swayed somewhat by that. On the other hand, Iraq, the the place where I fought. Um, was of course it was a mistake, and it was horrible. And you think of the thousands of Americans who were killed, and the and the tens of thousands of of Iraqis um, who were killed, who had their homes destroyed. Um, any you know, calling it for me anything but a tragic mistake um, wouldn't be true. Now I realize it's 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 incredibly complex, and 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 obviously that within that there were. You know there are there were possibilities for small moments of 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 kindness and uh, for for people to do things that did have meaning, whether it was on a small scale or in a particular context. But um, you know, for me, looking at it as a whole, no, it was it was absolutely a, a, a terrible, tragic mistake. One of Phil Clay's story kind of goes there, one of his stories, but it also is the one that's most often compared to, to Catch-22. Mm. Uh, well, here's the thing with me. I mean, oh, yeah, these are the things I don't know about. <coughs> I don't know what a terrorist is. I know that sometimes we are. Um, I don't know what an evildoer is. I don't even know what a spider hole is. I don't know what it means when you say bring someone to justice. I don't know what the coalition of the willing is. All I know is weapons of mass destruction. The United States has all of them. Mm. I know no Iraqis were involved in 911, and I know there weren't any Al Qaeda in Iraq until the war. Right. So it's like, and I know that George Bush wanted to go after Saddam Hussein because he wanted to kill his daddy. And I know all his advisors said, "Hey, why? What? What are you? Why not Iraq? That doesn't make any sense." So I know all those things, or at least I think those things. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you know, the good war, World War II, you didn't have to worry about any of that. Um, but in Iraq, um, that's what an intelligent person would worry about and what you apparently worried about. Yeah, absolutely. No, I mean, it became pretty apparent to me when I was there. And I was the second among, I was among the second group of uh of soldiers to be in Iraq, so there was the initial force that went in and invaded, and of course they were told we're looking for weapons of mass destruction, and um, by the time, you know, my group got there, a very large group, you know, uh, um, it was pretty obvious that that things weren't exactly the way that we had been told they would be. 
so so yeah no i mean i i don't really have much difficulty in in talking about uh iraq as a mistake i think i think generally it's pretty pretty well kind of just accepted right i mean in 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 the country that we sh- shouldn't have done it but i get when people want to make sure like you know i i uh I wasn't privy to the conversations that you had with with uh, David and, and Phil, but I'm going to guess that they wanted to make sure that you know they they acknowledge the kind of complexity of the situation and that kind of thing. But uh, and, and I and I get that. But um, you know, for me, I I kind of am, am comfortable getting that part of the conversation out of the way. Yes, obviously it was a mistake. And then there, are, of course, other aspects of the experience that we can talk about: um, the complexity, the you know, the the difficulty of one of the things that I really was trying to focus on in the in the story is how do you, um, you know, how do you how do you react to this kind of naive effort to do something good. Um, and, and and fail. What happens to you when you want to be good and, and fail, and you aren't presented with the opportunity to do good? You're presented with the opposite. Um, so, yeah, yeah, that's sort of a the way I think about it a little bit. Well, it's funny because you know Phil Clay's opening line of his first story is, you know, we we shot dogs. Right, right. And it's kind of like the same as you. It's like then he goes home and there's his dog who has to be put down and it's the same action but in an entire well yeah, and you do as he does you do a really good <coughs> job especially with Barl of coming back and people generally don't you're forgotten when you come back and, oh yeah absolutely and you know post traumatic stress syndrome he's like the poster boy for it and you know in World War Two you came back everyone loved you but you still have the same problems. Right. But now you have Effexor and Paxil and you have Xanax and you have <laughs> you have all these things that can kind of hide everything in a kind of cloud or mist. Right. But it's almost as if you're more, even more than Clay, kind of emphasizing the fact that coming back is just as difficult, maybe even, well, actually, yes, more difficult than being there. Yeah, for sure. And in in terms of the, you know, the problems as understood by, um, you know, people at large, the nation at large, I think I think it is a bigger problem. You know, people get that you're in physical danger when you're in war, but I think we're still kind of chipping away at this idea that, you know, you come home, you know, they they, some brass band plays a plays a song and then you're fine right i mean i think we're we're steadily getting rid of that idea and introducing the other ideas that no there's still difficulties you're still um in danger it's just danger of a different variety and and that was really you know something like half of of the yellow birds is set after um the narrator is is um by you know safe right i mean he's he's of course not but um he's returned to the united states he's not in any immediate physical danger but uh but half of the book is uh takes place in that setting and i wanted to make sure that i was you know not just acknowledging that part of the experience but emphasizing it and showing the you know hoping i could find some kind of drama in that and um uh, you know, let a let you know a reader who who maybe didn't understand that 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 kind of danger is real to show them you know how that isolation happens. What are the kind of consequences of of the experience of being in the war and taking those experiences home with you? Because you can't just you know you can't just turn them in when you turn in your rifle. You know. Yeah, and it's like the other thing is that you emphasize and people forget that. These are 18-year-old kids, you know. Children, right? Yeah, children. Yeah. My nephews are 18 and 21, and I can't even imagine. It would cha- It would obviously change, obviously, as, you know, it's 
it's silly to say otherwise, changed her entire life. And the other thing that people forget is that when you come back and your mom picks you up, just like your mom used to pick you up, you go home and there's your bedroom with the same posters on the War of Star Wars or right. or The Incredibles or what, you know whatever you had on on the wall before. And it's impossible to reconcile those two. Yeah, no, that's absolutely true. Absolutely true. And, um, you know, one of the ways that we can think about it is to, you know, say that, that, that most people who who end up in a war are, are, are very young. They're being asked to process a lifetime's worth of, of experience of, um, you know, of fear, of, of grief, of loss. Uh, and they're being asked to process a lifetime's worth of experience with uh, equipment that isn't even fully developed yet, you know. Um, you know, I was talking to somebody the other day, and they were they were telling me that the, the particular part of uh, the brain that remains kind of undeveloped when you're... Um, when you're like 18, 19, 20, the part that's still developing is the part that's kind of responsible for uh, patience, uh, like impulse control, ability to kind of be reflective, and um, you know, it, you know, I'm certainly not an expert in that area, but but that kind of jives with my experience of being 18. You know, just sort of, and then it's like, okay, yeah, and now deal with. Uh, and now deal with this lifetime's worth of, of, of emotional emotional experience. And, uh, yeah, it's, diffi- it's obviously very difficult for Bartle, the narrator, and, 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 and difficult for Sterling, too, and, 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 uh, and Murphy. And I think probably difficult for a lot of the men and women that are, that are coming back. Yeah, it's funny. You, you underscore really nicely the fact that, you know, if you're just reading the book and you don't bring it out, you think of Sterling as being like, you know, 40 years old. This old man that's leading him around, telling him what to do. He's been all over the place. He's been there. Right. But he's not. He's just a kid, too. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what's, you know, it's really amazing to me that, and then, of course, what happens if you have a lieutenant or someone who is still just a kid and doesn't have the capability um, to lead? But, right. But then you have Sterling who does, and he's under that. That's always, you know. I don't. How does that work out in war? I mean, did you right. encounter that? Yeah, I know. I mean, well, influence is always uh, influence is not always dependent on um, rank. On rank, right? Yeah. So, and, and you know, and I think we see that kind of stuff happen where um, you hear stories of, of people kind of starting their own their own little various groups and uh, extracurricular activities of the worst possible kind. And, and that stuff can be dangerous. I mean, so, you know, leadership is, is, is very important. And uh, it takes, you know, it takes the same forms that it takes everywhere else in the world, but uh, you know, just kind of with, with different stakes, you know. Yeah, it's almost like, uh, uh, this is a horrible comparison, but it's almost like watching an episode of The Office or something. Where the guy, who, where the guy who runs things is totally incompetent. No, I think that's a that, yeah, incompetence in more time is a very, very, very dangerous thing. Well, so I know that you. This is. I, I'm going to ask. I was going to ask you. Is this an autobiographical novel? But it kind of really isn't, is it? It's not. I mean, okay. So I suppose. I mean, if you look at the particulars of what they. What these what these characters do, then no, it's not autobiographical at all. If you look at it kind of through the lens of what um, these characters think about, what they're afraid of, or the kind of um, feeling of uh, the, you know the feelings that they experience when they return home, um, then certainly, I mean, in a lot of ways, there are there are parallels to things that I thought about, things that I was afraid of, things that I um, felt when I when I returned home, uh, the confusion and, 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 and that sort of thing. Um, that aligns in a way with, with my own experience. But um, but no, in, in terms of, you know, the actual narrative, no, it, um, obviously when, in term, you know, when you're describing and so forth, yeah, you draw on your own 
experience. You know, what what does this look like? What does that feel like? But um, but no, it's it's uh, quite different from from mine um, in its particulars. Thankfully, I'm very very happy about that. <laughs> so, it's funny because poetry, which is which is your first love. I mean, that poem that I excerpted from with regard to what war is, it's. It gave me a feeling again of how poetry, uh, in a different way, can can compress all the things you wrote in your book. Mm -hmm. And do you, do you feel that way as well? I think so. Yeah. There's something. One of the. I mean, for me, the great thing about reading poetry is it. You know, the immediacy with which it can kind of <clears throat> transmit that energy or that uh, uh, that emotion. Um, it seems to me at times that. <clears throat> poetry, it's almost as if it's not even asking necessarily for your for your comprehension. Right. Almost in a way it's asking for your kind of apprehension, um, if you take my meaning. Um, so there's something about it that I, I think it is able to, um, you know, Charles Olson, you know, talk about like that transfer of energy or whatever that can happen. Um with the poem, and I think, yeah, for me, you know, I'm hoping to to transfer that energy to the reader, and, and when I put, pick up a book of poems, I'm, I'm hoping to receive that energy. And the great thing about, you know, the great thing about the the, the novel in particular, and, and stories, are its immersive qualities, um, that, that there is a sort of kind of world that gets built. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I've always, you know, the, the, those two forms have have been the forms that I've always turned to, um, uh, you know, since since I was introduced to them, really, as a as a kind of early teenager, twelve year old, whatever. Um, for me, it's always been the poem and the novel. I don't I don't know why. I mean, I I do, of course, there are short stories I admire, but um, and I like to read nonfiction, but. Uh, but those two forms have been the ones that I have always responded to most powerfully. It's really funny because, like, the shortest poem in the world, you know, William Carlos Williams, you know, so much depends upon a red wheelbarrow glazed with rainwater beside the white chickens. I mean, I read that, and it's like, okay, that explains the entire universe. <laughs> right. And I have no idea why it does. Yeah, and, uh, no, and, and that's good, and that's kind of the point, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. It, it's a, it's about um, <clears throat> it's taking a kind of oblique angle to to, to things, and um, for me, it's always been a really productive way of interacting with with the world um, by, by reading poets. It's funny too, you know. I have I have an independent bookstore, Wellington Square Bookshop. Um, uh, your book is prominently displayed, and I probably think it'll be a book club uh, prediction. I mean, I, I predict it will be a book club selection. Um, but you know, I have a poetry section, but no one ever, go, no one ever goes there. And it's like in today's world, it's just I don't know what it is, but people like Marianne Moore, a poem should not m mean but be. It's like people don't get that anymore. I don't think, or very few people. I think you know, and this is you know, this has come up a bunch um, over the last couple of weeks with different people. Um, you know, I think I think part of it um, has to do with the fact that it, it, the way that poetry is introduced um, to us at, when we're young readers. Now, I know it's not. The, they're excellent teachers. My, my English teachers were great. I was excited by poetry. But I think I, I, I was excited by it organically. I would have been excited by it any, anywhere. But I think for a lot of people, it's, it's presented first as a difficult thing, right? It's presented first as something you're going to have a hard time understanding. Um, and when it's presented like that, it, it I mean, of course people turn away from it, right? You're in ninth or tenth grade, and you're like, oh, this is something that's going to be really hard or, or it's well yeah as you're ninth or tenth grade you they ask you know you're reading the rhyme of the ancient Mar mariner <laughs> right um but but then you know the way you get to it i think is a lot of it is through robert frost yeah sure because you can understand that 
whether it's stopping by woods on a snowy evening or whether it's the road less taken, you can understand that and you know what it means. Right, right. Yeah, so I think there's, you know, I think part of it is just it, there's something in the way that it's presented that, you know, if people's first first impression is that it's something to be resisted and that, that can last for a long time. And it wasn't, I mean, relatively speaking, it wasn't all that long ago that poetry would have been in every home in America. Um, so I don't know. I'm keeping the faith with the uh, poetry it means it means a lot to me i know i know there are people out there you know like you're saying uh for whom it means a lot too but uh but yeah it's it's uh it's occasionally a bummer well it's tough for me to get anybody to read you know i'm in, right. an independent bookstore i'm not going to get rich <laughs> right, right, i'm right. trying to fill a niche that's very small and uh, have an enormous amount of competition. Yeah. But, you know, like with stuff like flash fiction now, maybe poetry is more accessible. If you read a short story that's three lines long and understand it. Right, right. You know? Yeah, and this, you know, I think these these kinds of things probably ebb and flow a little bit. And, uh, you know, I, I imagine, you know, poetry is at, at the very minimum thousands of years old, right? So, um I think it's going to be around for a while, um, so I, I, you know, I try to I try to be optimistic about it. But but yeah, it's it's you know yeah you're right. I mean, poetry is facing challenges. Um, yeah. Writing that aspires to be art is certainly facing facing challenges too. You know, so it's uh, but you know, just got to keep at it. The thing about it is, is that. You can kind of define what a book is, whether it's fiction, nonfiction, what genre it's in. Um, is it a good book? Is it a bad book? That kind of thing. But how would you even uh, you? How would you? How do you define poetry? What is poetry? <laughs> well, I've always thought the. Um, you know, I know it's it's a it's a it's a pretty broad definition, but uh, was it the Berryman that said? Uh, a, a poet is a man or a woman alone in the room with the English language. <laughs> I think I'm. A, I mean, I, I've always thought that was a, an acceptable definition. Um, you know, you see what happens. It's it's unpredictable. It's um, you know, it's it's so accepting. It you know, it can take so many forms and so many shapes and and yeah, it's malleable in that way. But. Uh, yeah, it's just a product of a man or a woman alone in a room with the English language. I mean, that's kind of, it can be so many different things. Right. And, you know, sometimes, well, and your book is poetic in that sense, um, I, th I think. And that's what makes it um, intriguing to a lot of people, I believe. Well, so... Uh, to you know, I've kept you for almost fifty minutes, but to to end it um, along the lines of what we're talking about, what which way are you going now? Is your next work going to be in another novel? Is it going to be a volume of poetry, or both? <clears throat> well, I have a, a collection of poetry that's coming out uh, April first. Oh, okay. Um, so I'm I'm excited about that, and I'm at work at work on another novel now. It's uh, pretty early in the in the. You know, in the process of working on it, but it's um, set uh, just after the American Civil War is over in Virginia, uh, where, which is, of course, where I grew up. And I'm really interested in looking at that period of, of history, particularly, the, you know, the, the fact that we as a nation, at, at that point, I think there was a real opportunity um, for there to be justice and, and equality like like actual justice and equality in our country in a way that we'd never had before and something happened uh, something happened in those in those first few months and years that caused us to have another century and a half of, of inequality and injustice so I'm right now, right now writing a story where I'm, I'm hoping I can explore what happened so it's like it's like it's but it's like this it could have been this way but 
and you're after the butt, right? I, I'm after the butt, yeah. I mean, you know, and it's it's of course it's got to be about people first, you know, and 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 uh, and characters and the choices that they make. Um, but I'm hoping some of those kind of thematic questions I have, um, I'll be able to explore. So I, I, I'm excited about it. Um, I'm excited to to. to to get to work on it and dive all the way in, and uh, I'm excited. I'm gonna have a couple of opportunities to 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 talk about um, the poetry that's coming out, and I'm excited about that as well. So, yeah. Uh, next week I interview yeah. Philip Meyer, who uh, Philip Myers, who wrote The Sun. Yeah, sure. Which is this sprawling. You know, I don't read that kind of stuff. The sprawling <laughs> Western epic, almost like an intelligent Dallas, and. <laughs> uh, but yeah, what's great about the show is I read stuff I, I wouldn't read normally a lot. Right, right, right. And and then I say, and then I find out I really like it a lot. Which I never thought I would like something like. Yeah, that. he's 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 actually the Philip's a good friend of mine. And, really? Uh, yeah, I really, I really, really admire that book a lot. I think it's uh, an incredible accomplishment. It's really hard to look at a book and see that it has like seventy some cha- chapters. Right, exactly. <laughs> but he does like you do. It's like. Um, Every chapter, you know, he goes, it's one character, the next chapter is right. another character. And you do the same kind of thing in, uh, in your book, too, right, right. going backwards and forwards. Um, well, anyway, yeah, so if it's coming out April 1st, maybe we can talk to your publicist again, and maybe we can talk about that book. That, I, yeah, I really, I really enjoyed this. I would, uh, I would look forward to that. Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. I really enjoyed it. Sorry if I talked too much. No, I no, no. This was, this was great. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. So, Kevin Powers, um, the book is The Yellow Birds. It's hard to read because there's a lot of nasty stuff that goes on in in Iraq. Um, you know, the things that had to happen, little kids getting killed by mistake, uh, uh, soldiers who are too young to understand exposing themselves to the possibility or the actuality of death. And um, it is it is written very poetically, and it, it does set things up as if it was a Greek tragedy with good, evil, something in between, like a Greek chorus. And... Um, Afterwards, you know, not like like not like many books, is that right? You think about it. You just don't put it down and move on to the next thing. You do think about it. You think about the uselessness of all of it, but you also think about what it does to people and how it gives rise to this ability to convey something that would otherwise not be conveyed. It's not enough to justify what happened or what you did. But it's enough to create literature that explains what man is, what man could be, um, and the worst that man is. And it's funny, there's no women either. So anyway, that was great. Um, Next week uh, on The Avid Reader, oh, yeah, I'll tell you. So like what we're doing now is like, um, like, 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 what we're doing now is revamping our entire web presence so we have a new website that'll be live this week next week whatever and you know we'll have an instagram feed we'll have a twitter feed i'll be live we may have this show and other things streaming live on youtube because now you can stream live on youtube um we'll be uh, on pinterest facebook yelp we'll have contests um have all kinds of new things and um, I'm not sure whether it's going to monetize the bookstore to any extent but it'll get us out there we'll have our blog we'll have our newsletter uh, we'll have uh, ebooks for sale and pretty much any of the 400 500,000 books that are now in print um, you'll be able to buy from us as well and, and then of course <clears throat> my collection of used and rare books and signed first editions that are laying over my all over my house and in our warehouse so um, no, I forgot what I was going to say. Oh, next week. Next week on The Avid Reader, we will be speaking with Charles Belfort about his great, great novel, The Paris Architect. So it's about occupied France. It's about Nazis. It's about Jews. It's about collaborators with the Germans. It's about the French resistance. It's about really kind souls, real devils, beautiful women and mistresses, <laughs> hiding places, and then primarily architecture and how it informs the entire book. Um, it's an excellent book. It's a real, it's not, I don't want to say easy read, but it, you, you fly through it. I, I read it in one sitting, as I did with this one. And um, I think that you'll really enjoy it. I think listen next week and 
if you haven't already read it, I think after you listen to the show, um, you'll definitely want to. So thanks as always, and for me being long-winded, and you know, I I talk too much. To, <laughs> I talk too much to let the author really get in everything he wants to say. But I think we really did get along well with Kevin Powers, and um, I'm just so thankful that they're willing to appear. And you now he's writing this book of poetry. Poetry is something you guys should be reading, and uh, comes out April first. And hopefully we'll get him back here, and we can talk about that as well. So thanks again. I will uh, talk to you guys next week, and um, it's a pleasure um, having you as my audience, and please come by and see us at Wellington Square Bookshop, just off the Downingtown Interchange of the Turnpike in the Eagle View community, and um, we'll treat you to a cup of coffee, and you'll get 20% off of all bestsellers, and whatever else I can do to get you in there. Talk to you soon. You've been listening to The Avid Reader Show with your host, Sam Hankin. Sam will be back next week with reviews and interviews of some of the more interesting books and authors of today.